Hello and welcome. We begin the news with ongoing conflict keeps Myanmar in a state of crisis, says United Nations. Trump holds Pennsylvania rally to regain Latino support. Harris urges unity in final push at crowded DC rally. Biden moves to calm backlash after calling Trump backers garbage and Australia to increase missile production after China ICBM test. Stay with me for these and more stories. A United Nations report has cautioned Myanmar is stalled in crisis as conflict intensifies with criminal networks out of control and human suffering at unprecedented levels. On Tuesday, United Nations Special Envoy for Myanmar, Julie Bishop, told the United Nations General Assembly's Human Rights Committee that Myanmar actors must move beyond the current zero-sum mentality. Bishop called for an end to the violence, emphasizing that there can be little progress on addressing the needs of people while armed conflict continues across the Southeast Asian country, causing increasing civilian casualties. The conflict has so severely undermined the rule of law that trans transnational crime emanating from Myanmar is proliferating, she added. The sheer scale of arms production and trade, human trafficking, drug manufacturing and trafficking, and scam centers means Myanmar now ranks highest among all member states for organized crime, she said. The criminal networks are out of control. The army in Myanmar overthrew the elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi in February 2021 and suppressed extensive protests demanding a return to democratic rule. In the past year, powerful ethnic armed groups have gained territory with the military's government's forces progressively on the back foot in fighting. The United Nations approximates 3 million people are displaced across Myanmar and some 18.6 million need humanitarian aid. Bishop, who earlier served as Australian Foreign Minister, said she has engaged with the government, including Senior General Mi Eun Liang in Myanmar's capital, Nipindo, as well as opposition representatives and ethnic um, organizations. It was uncertain when the meetings took place and Bishop gave no further details. The United Nations envoy said she also visited China and Thailand and will soon visit India and Bangladesh, continuing to urge neighboring countries to leverage their influence. She says she will also return to Nibadua, but gave no time frame. Any path to reconciliation requires an end to violence, accountability, and unfettered access for the United Nations and partners, Bishop said. U.S. 2024 election Donald Trump, Republican presidential candidate, has made an appeal to the Latino stronghold of Allentown, Pennsylvania, shortly after his controversial rally in New York's Madison Square Garden. The, on the Tuesday evening event came as Trump continues to battle with the fallout from the New York rally where a comedian compared Puerto Rico with a floating island of garbage. But Trump appeared to brush aside the controversy on stage in Allentown, the Republican leader surrounded himself on stage with figures from the Latino community as if to drive home the point. Local mayoral candidates Tim Ramos, Cuban-American Senator Marcus Rubio, and Zoraida Buxo, the show senator from Puerto Rico, all spoke at the Allentown event on his behalf. It was a show of deviance for Trump, who has withered scandal in the past, prompting some critics to call him Teflon Don. But the Allentown rally was also a risky ploy as it placed him in the midst of a community that will have felt the sting of the Madison Square Garden remarks acutely. Lehay County, where Allentown is located, boasts in biggest Latino community in the critical swing state of Pennsylvania. The projected 96,981 Latinos live in Lehay County, according to the 2020 census, out of a total of 375,557 residents that amounts to over a quarter of the population. Numerous protesters assembled outside of the local PL PPL center in Allentown on Tuesday to denounce Trump's appearance at the venue. Some chanted, immigrants make America great, a variation on Trump's campaign slogan, make America great again. Others shouted in Spanish for Trump to go away. But other members of the local Latino community nevertheless came out to show their support for Trump with signs like Boricaos con Trump, which translates to Puerto Ricans for Trump.
still sticking with U.S. 2024 election. It was Democratic presidential candidate Kamala Harris's closing argument to the nation. One final huge appeal to voters before the November 5th election day. And it took place in a highly symbolic venue, the Ellipse a Park, just south of the White House in Washington, D.C., Less than four years earlier, on January 6, 2021, the ellipse had been the site of a different address from Harris's Republican rival, then President Donald Trump. There, he whipped up false fears of election fraud, leaving several of his supporters to attack the United States Capitol in an attempt to avert the certification of the 2020 election. That discord, Harris on Tuesday told the sprawling crowds was the opposite of what she would bring to the White House if elected. That symbolism was the defining message of the night and the counterpiece, the centerpiece rather, of a speech intended to be an exclamation point at the end of an, an atypically brief campaign. With precisely seven days before election day, it remains unclear whether Harris's message will be enough to give her the edge over Trump, with whom she is locked in a tighter race. Polls have shown the candidates remain neck and neck both nationally and in a handful of key swing states. With at least 15 million voters having already cast their ballots, the outcome is mainly seen as a toss-up. Still, U.S. 2024 election Joe Biden, United States President, has been forced to issue a clarification after he appeared to refer to supporters of Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump as garbage on Tuesday in a live stream with the advocacy group Voto Latino. Biden tried to denounce the rhetoric at a recent Trump rally at Madison Square Garden, which was condemned as racist and misogynistic. Just the other day, a speaker at his rally called Puerto Rico a floating island of garbage. Biden said in the live stream before proceeding to call Puerto Ricans good, decent, honorable people. Then he added, the only garbage I see floating out there is his supporters, his hatred, his demonization of Latinos is unconstitutionable and it's un-American. The episode was quickly seized upon by leading Republicans, including Trump, who interpreted the statement as an assault towards the average conservative voter. Some drew parallels to Democratic Hillary Clinton, who called Trump supporters deplorables during her bid for the presidency in 2016. But Biden and his team have since issued statements looking to illuminate that his remarks applied to only applied only to the Madison Square Garden speaker Trump supporter and comedian Tony Hinchcliffe. The White House spokesperson Andrew Bates immediately dismissed the notion that Biden was referring to Trump supporters. The Democratic president, Bates said, referred to the hateful rhetoric at the Madison Square Garden rally as garbage and not the voters. In a transcript, the White House released the word supporters was a singular possessive in seeming reference to Hinchcliffe as opposed to the plural noun supporters. Shortly afterwards, Biden also said in a statement to address the issue. For several Democrats, the scrutiny on Biden's remarks was yet another reflection of his tendency to mangle his words or get information mixed up. The 81-year-old seeming frailty on displaying during his June debates with Trump was the driving factor of him to eventually drop his bid for re-election. Even within his own party, critics questioned his continued ability to lead. After Biden exist, exited the race in July, Vice President Kamala Harris instantly stepped forward as his replacement, generating a rise of enthusiasm. She has continued to defend Biden during her campaign, even telling the talk show The View there is not a thing that comes to mind that she would do differently than he would. Away from U.S. 2024 election now to Australia, Australia will add its missile defense capability after China's test of an intercontinental ballistic missile ICBM in the South Pacific raised significant concerns and as the Asia-Pacific region enters a missile age. Japan and South Korea on issues of regional stability. Australian Minister for Defence Industry Pat Conroy said in a speech on Wednesday that Australia plans to search its missile defence and long-range strike capability and will cooperate with security partners, the United States. Strategic competition between the US and China is a main feature of Australia's security environment, Conroy told the National Press Club in Canberra. That competition is at its sharpest in our region, the Indo-Pacific, he said. 
adding that the region was on the point of a new missile age, where missiles are also tools of coercion. He also pointed to China's test firing of an ICBM in September that journeyed over 11,000 kilometers, 6,835 6, miles to land in the Pacific Ocean, northeast of Australia. Australia is among many Asia-Pacific nations that are dramatically intensifying defense spending. In April, Australia launched a defense strategy that envisioned a sharp surge in spending to counter its vulnerability to foes, interrupting trade or stop access to vital air and sea routes. Besides speedily developing its surface fleet, Australia plans to deploy stealthy nuclear-powered submarines in a tripartite agreement with the United States and the UK, known as the AUKUS. Richard Marley's defense minister said Australia was inaugurating its blueprint for rapid missile manufacturing domestically and the acquisition of long-range strike capability for the country. Australia earlier this month announced a seven billion Australian dollars, that's 5.58 billion US dollars, deal with the US to acquire SM2 II-3C and a Raytheon SM6 long-range missiles for its navy. On more stories and on Israel-Gaza war, Israel bombs Gaza's Beit Lahia again after 93 killed. Again, Israel's military has bombarded residential buildings in Gaza's Beit Lahia, killing no less than 19 Palestinians as civilians in the besieged northern town search for survivors in the aftermath of an earlier Israeli attack that killed closely 100 people. The new Israeli bombing late on Tuesday night hit numerous homes belonging to the Alu family, according to the Palestinian civil defense in Gaza. The attack came less than a day after Israel's military bombed a five-story building belonging to the Abu Nasr family in Beit Lahia, killing at least 93 people and wounding dozens more. The Ministry of Health in Gaza said at least 25 children were among the dead. Israel's military said it was looking into the reports of the strike, while its major ally, the United States, called the attack horrifying. The United Nations Human Rights Office, OHCHR, said it was appalled by the bombing, describing it one of the deadliest single attacks in Gaza in nearly three months. The United Nations Humanitarian Agency said the assault on the Abu Nasser family home was among seven mass casualty incidents in Gaza in the past week alone. Israel's mountain air and ground raid on Beit Lahia comes as its siege of northern Gaza has entered its 26th day. The Israeli military said it launched the offensive to stop Hamas fighters from regrouping in the north of the territory, despite saying earlier this year that it had wiped out the Palestinian group which governs Gaza in the area. Over 100,000 people remain trapped in the north without food and water, and dozens remain buried in the rubble of bombed homes, with rescue workers unable to reach them due to Israel's ongoing siege and attacks, according to the Palestinian civil defense. Now, experts warn climate change is raising heat related deaths. Climate change is rising temperatures to dangerous levels, triggering more deaths and the spread of infectious diseases while exacerbating drought and food security. A new report by health experts has cautioned. According to the Lancet Countdown, an annual report released on Wednesday based on work by 122 experts, including the World Health Organization, who in 2023, the hottest year on record, the average person experienced 50 more days of dangerous temperatures than they will have without climate change. The report was released as heat waves, fires, hurricanes, droughts and floods have continued in full force this year, which is anticipated to exceed 2023 to become the hottest year in record. Current policies and actions, if sustained, put the world on track to 2.7 degrees Celsius of heating by 2100, the report said. Saying of 15 indicators that the experts have been tracking over the last eight years, 10 have reached concerning new records, the report said, including surging severe weather events, elderly deaths from heat, and people going without food at droughts and flow heat crops. The elderly are the most vulnerable with the number of heat-connected deaths in people over 65 last year reaching a level of 167% above the number of such deaths in the 1990s. Marina Belen Romanello, Executive Director of the Lancet Countdown, said year on year, 
the deaths directly associated with climate change are increasing. But heat is also affecting not just the mortality and increasing deaths, but also increasing the diseases and the pathologies associated with heat exposure, she said. Surging temperatures are profit losses too, the report added. Last year's extreme heat cost the world an approximated 512 billion potential labor hours worth hundreds of billions of dollars in potential income. The report also tracked how oil and gas companies as well as some governments and banks were fueling the fire of climate change. Large oil and gas companies which have been posting record profits have increased fossil fuel production since last year according to a report. Several countries doled out new subsidies to fossil fuels to counteract soaring oil and gas prices after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022. Climate change is also making food more unreliable, the authors warned, with up to 48% of the world's land area facing severe drought conditions last year. The researchers said around 151 million more people will be experiencing food insecurity as a result, compared with the years 1981 to 2010. We take a breather now when we come back. Stories from Nigeria. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. And now in stories from Nigeria, we begin with a sharp rise of event. NNPCL raises petrol price to 1,060 naira per litre just three weeks after increasing the price of premium motor spirit, popularly known as petrol. On Tuesday, Nigerians were heated when the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, NNPCL, adjusted the pump prices of the commodity as oil marketers foresee for the price spikes in the short term. The national oil firm raised the retail price of petrol in Abuja to 1,016 naira from 1,013 naira per litre, report across multiple NNPCL stations in the federal capital territory, said on Tuesday. In Lagos, it was confirmed that NNPCL stations added the unit price of the commodity from 998 naira per litre to 1,025 naira per litre, which received extensive criticism from the organized private sector, civil society organizations, and Nigerians in general. Experts and major followers of the Nigerian oil and gas sector fear inflation in the country may fall the skyrocket following the newest increase after it rose to 28-year high that's 34.2% in June, which could compound the hardship in the country. These came as Dangote Petroleum Refinery blamed the continued importation of petrol by oil marketers and NNPCL, despite the fact that a commodity was produced in the country by a 20 billion US dollars lekki based plant. Al Haji Aliku Dangote, the president of Dangote Groups, raised the concern in Abuja on Tuesday after he was summoned by President Bola Tinibu alongside the Minister of Finance, Wale Edun, and the group Chief Executive Officer of NNPCL, Mele Kiari. And finally, on the news, on the ongoing power outage, power to North will be restored in five days. This is coming from the TCN. The transmission company of Nigeria, TCN, has set an aim to completely restore power to most parts of northern Nigeria by Sunday, 3rd November 2024, after major transmission line damage led to a regional blackout. TCN and TCN's managing director, Sule Abdulaziz, speaking at a press briefing in Abuja on Tuesday, assured that engineers were working diligently to repair vital infrastructure and restore the northern region's electricity supply. The development has left millions without power and brought economic activities in the region to near a standstill. As a speedy step, TCN said it will transmit 400 megawatts of power from Benue Enugu lines to select at to select areas within the next 24 hours while efforts are on to restore power supply to the whole region in two weeks' time. The blackout started on 22nd October after the 330 kilovolts Ukwaji Apu double circuit transmission lines 1 and 2 tripped, affecting the northwest, northeast, and parts of north central. The outage exacerbated as TCN reported that the Shiroro Kaduna line had been vandalized, majorly dropping bulk electricity to major cities like Kaduna and Kano. 
complications continued two days later with a snap 330 kV transmission line in Benue State. In response to the recurring power outages triggered by vandalism and security issues affecting Nigeria's electricity infrastructure, the federal government said it has started processes to procure helicopters to safeguard critical transmission lines and facilities across the country. So there was a proposal we gave two years ago to buy a new chopper. It's still ongoing. Number one, we need the finances, and number two, the approvals, according to Abdulaziz. This was as Adebayo Adelabu, Minister of Power, called for a bar on sale of scrap metals like electricity cables, poles, and other install installations to discourage the vandalization of electrical facilities across the country. He clamored for a legislative regulation that will ensure firmer penalties on electricity vandals to serve deterrence to intended ones. TCN's Abdulaziz explained that ongoing security challenges have stalled repairs with engineers needing military escorts to access the damaged areas safely. He said each day work ends by 6 p.m. to ensure safety as engineers are transported to secure locations overnight before resuming the next morning. On Monday, President Bola Tinivu had directed TCN to speed up repairs and instructed the National Security Advisor Nuhuri Badu to provide additional security support to facilitate swift restoration efforts. TCN's ongoing efforts underscore the challenges of maintaining secure infrastructure in volatile areas and highlight the broader need for a resilient energy supply network to avoid future disruptions. Special Assistant to the President on Community Engagement, Abdullahi Tankoya Kasai, appealed to the affected people to remain patient with the authorities to fix the issues. A recap of major stories says ongoing conflict keeps Myanmar in a state of crisis. This is coming from the United Nations. Trump holds Pennsylvania rally to regain Latino support. Harris urges unity in final push at crowded D.C. rally. Biden moves to calm backlash after calling Trump backers garbage. And Australia to increase measles production after China ICBM test. That's all on the news. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.